So we're, we have time for a, a nice conversation, and I'll begin by asking a few questions to Petra, but we, we can also include you, the audience. So I believe there's a roaming microphone. Um, we'll, we'll have the audience questions after I've, I've asked a few, but just raise your hand, and I'll, I'll point to you and wait for the microphone. <laughs> Somebody very eager there. Um, thank you very much for your film, Petra, uh, and thank you for bringing it to, to Sheffield and, and sharing it with this audience. Um, it is a, a portrait of political upheaval within your country uh, and a personal journey through that. I wanted to ask, firstly, um, how within that turbulence uh, you as a filmmaker found your voice and, and found your vision to navigate things that are ever-changing? Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Uh, a few months before the turbulence began, I had seen The Battle of Chile by Patricio Guzman, yeah. which was a huge inspiration. And I felt it was already uh, kind of a, a telling and a, a lens through which I could see so much of what was happening in Brazilian society. And what inspired me in that film is that it manages to portray a political crisis in the country. And the country is actually the main character where he's following the streets, the Congress, the politicians, the social movements, um, and not necessarily just politicians. Um, and so that's what I wanted to do. And, and that was a very good guideline. And Guzman, uh, later I would hear that he says, when you're making a, a political documentary, like this or any film, he says, you have to go deep into the subject matter and then, if possible, leave the country, go somewhere else so that you can see things from a distance. And in making that film, I think that was the main way I could survive the turbulence, to be in Brazil filming and then have moments where, for example, edit labs, where I would show the film in another country to Ukrainians, Chinese, and, uh, who had no connection to the story and see how much it, they understood because the political passions in Brazil were so high that it was hard to really see what was happening there. Mm. But there were moments where the nausea was so great that I would actually like wake up with nausea. And, and making the film was somewhat a therapeutical process for, to go through this trauma. And also perhaps a learning process for yourself to, to really engage with that historical trajectory which you, you lived through. You know, you mentioned in the film, I, I was born, I'm as old as democracy in, in Brazil. Um, and I, I wanted to ask also in, in terms of your own filmmaking style, uh, you, you make very personal films. Was this, this idea uh, of kind of adding a personal narrative, adding the, the voice of yourself to the film, something that came about in the editing process? Or did you, as you were observing the changes, find your voice and, and begin to kind of script your, your direction through it? Yeah, I. It, this was kind of the only film that I started making without ever thinking I, I would make it. Like one day I was filming a protest and I was like, I have to, I was so daunted by it uh, that I was like, I have to, to make a film. And so I started filming and it was only in, throughout one month of filming, I was like, what film am I going to make? And, and the sentence came to mind, like I am the same age. Um, and, and that sentence was the seed of the idea that I was interested in exploring, which is, a citizen's relationship to his or her own democracy in a moment where we're all kind of surprised, I think, with this crisis of democracy. Is it a middle age crisis? Is it a death crisis? What exactly are we facing? So that was what I wanted to investigate. Mm -hmm. And you're very much observing, as the title suggests, the edge of what that might be, the challenges in terms of corruption, in terms of political transition within the country. Um, and it's somewhat historically the, the bifurcation there is between left and right. And your family, uh, at least your parents, you mentioned that the generation prior were somewhat part of the establishment, but your parents were left wing. Um, did that kind of influence your your understanding of some of the stories that were coming out, and particularly the, the car wash case where, 
you do feel some of the facts are subject to um, ideology and the f facts <laughs> are subject to ideology. Mm -hmm. um, did, were you also beginning to mistrust the portrayal of these people that you believed in, the likes of Lula? Mm -hmm. um, w w w did you think that perhaps, you know, there is a truth in, in their involvement in corruption? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think the film was a huge learning experience. I had a superficial understanding of both Brazilian history and and politics. And once I began, I, I, I confess I began with a kind of a, 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 with a lot of passion where I, it was hard for me in the beginning to hear people from a different political spectrum. And it was in the process where I learned how to listen to them and and actually there were moments where I was convinced by them and was like, actually, I think Domus should be impeached and maybe Lula is ex really guilty. And then it was going to the facts and really, so I, I, I put myself in a position to be surprised by either side. I tried cons mm -hmm. constantly not to be attached to one side or the other and the facts uh, after much investigation, it became clear that one, different from what was being expressed, Duma was not being accused of corruption, but a fiscal peddling that most presidents had done before. So even though I discovered she had been a president with many frailties um, and was responsible for the economic crisis somewhat that came into Brazil, there were no strong grounds for her impeachment. Mm. And, and, um, and Lula, I mean, as I show in the film, the systemic corruption that was financing all the campaigns of every president before and after him uh, were illegal. And it's a pity that he and his party did not use the extreme leverage they had when he was extremely popular to change the law and and make it so that they would stop these illegal financing of campaigns from happening. However, that's not what is taking him to prison. Mm -hmm. the, 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 his prison is from jur considered from jurists from both sides of the spectrum illegal and that's unquestionable. Yeah. But it's perhaps what the public of Brazil understand to be the reason of, of impeachment, but and also, um, you know, of Lula's downfall, the portrayal in the media is that um, it is about corruption. It's not this, you know, minor case. And, and also the the case of the apartment is there's zero evidence, as you show in the film. Um, I wanted to ask, as, as Lula mentioned, the, the seven media organizations, the main media organizations in Brazil are owned by uh, individual families. How do you think this film will perhaps counter that that narrative, um, portraying a kind of wider, wider truth? Well, I hope it will. I hope it will go beyond kind of the superficial cloud of confusion around corruption and elucidate some of the facts that were not clear, uh, for me at least, from what I was seeing in the news. There was the spectrum spectacularization of Operation Car Wash um, that was, that kind of blinded the entire population and made most people think that the entire political class was just completely corrupt and should be taken out of power. And, and I think it's a moment where it's very important for people to regain faith in democracy and understand with more clarity what is fiction and what is fact. And I hope the film can somehow collaborate with that. And you gain, I guess, a, a question for the filmmakers here. You gain access, incredible access, into this political situation to Dilma, uh, to, uh, at moments, Bolsonaro, who I'm sure you're quite politically opposed to. Uh, how, did you, how did you manage to navigate those mm -hmm. corridors of power? And, and in ca some cases, literally the corridors, you're showing the, the, the amazing architecture of these institutions. It was a long process. So as soon as the turbulence began, I wrote a letter, both to Dilma and to Lula, asking for an interview. But of course, they never read that, those letters. 
So I started filming what I could, first the streets, then the Congress, and once in Congress, every person I met who had somehow a relationship with them, I would ask help to be able to interview Dilma, but they would say it was almost impossible. Until one point, um, months later, Dilma's assistant said that I could finally interview her. So I came back to Brasilia with, with the crew, with my crew, and but every day he was like, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, day after tomorrow. So we would go and film the bus station and golf clubs and evangelical masses. And, and the day of Dilma's interview never came. So we gave up and left. And of course, soon after, he said, OK, tomorrow be here at the palace and you'll have the interview. And we did. But it was a very formal interview that did not even make it to the film. Yeah. But then I think we started establishing a relationship of trust that months later you will see uh, the, the image where I'm with her in the car. Yeah. Um, at this point, I noticed there was quite a lot of eagerness out there, particularly this guy <laughs> with a red shirt, uh, to ask questions. So I'd like to open it to a, a couple audience questions before we further discuss the film. Um, yeah, this, this gentleman in the red shirt first, please. Well, first, uh, first of all, con congratulations. Your film is outstanding. We need, uh, people need to find out what's happening in Brazil. Um, I'm Brazilian. I live in the UK. Um, I'm grateful we, we have this opportunity. Um, you talked about the media organizations in Brazil, the seven media organizations, but uh, in my opinion, that's, um, that's not just in Brazil. I think the British media have um, failed Brazil in many ways. Um, we ne we never heard anything about what was happening, or very, very little, very, very shy coverage. And you could argue Brazil is secondary. No, everyone's always talking about Venezuela. Everyone seems to be an expert in Venezuela. The BBC, The Guardian, yet no one is ever talking about Brazil. Perhaps a little bit now that Bolsonaro is in power. But not when we had the coup, not when Lula was in prison. And right now, Lula is the most important political prisoner in the world. Uh, the caliber of Mandela. And no, I'm sorry, this country, the media in this country simply aren't talking about it. So um, why? Uh, uh, so do you share this opinion? Do you think that uh, the world is a kind of turning a, a blind eye and failing Brazil? Or are you perhaps um, a little bit more optimistic uh, than me? Because I think we need, we need the world on our side if we're to get Lula out of prison. I think Lula is the biggest political prisoner in the world. And uh, people are not talking about it. Uh, the the uh, uh, very few politicians in this country have uh, have expressed support for Lula. Uh, Jeffrey Robertson, who you filmed in your film, he was the only international observer, uh, and he was a lawyer in Lula's trial. There was no one, uh, no international observer in the sham trial. So wh wh why is the world being uh, failing Brazil, and is the world failing Brazil? Thank you. Yes. Uh there, there, there were very good articles, though, in the Guardian and in the New York Times. They took a while to 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 actually be published, but they were quite thorough in showing that there were no how unfounded Dilma's impeachment was, and uh, one column by Mike Mark Weisbrot in the New York Times. But very little, of course, compared to Venezuela and the coverage over the Middle East. Uh, unfortunately, Brazil has had very little coverage internationally. And Latin America in general, except for Venezuela, is almost invisible to the international media. And I agree that I think Jeffrey Robertson is a, an amazing um, spokesperson for Lula's case. Um, I had the privilege of being with him uh, day before yesterday in the screening we had in London. And I hope pe more people around the world will be able to hear his defense on Lula. Um, I think there was uh, another question just further down the aisle in the middle here. And thanks for making the film. I thought it was really powerful. Um, it's obviously quite specific in looking at the history of 
Brazil and how its politics are, how they are today. Um, but I was thinking kind of a bit more broadly, like if you think there's one part in the film where you talk about kind of the decline of the left, and it kind of, I was thinking about, say, the Indian elections recently, where it's something quite similar, and also like international media perhaps has been slow to kind of look at what has actually been happening. But I was thinking, what what did you think, or what, what do you sort of um, attribute that to? Do you think it's simply, because it seems like um, right-wing um, political parties seem to just be better at adapting to the new way of campaigning, new technology, and so on and so forth, where it seems like the left have seemed to be left behind. Do you think that's just because of, say, oligarchs providing more money? Or do you think it's something else? Do you think it's like a failure of, like a crisis of confidence in not knowing what, how to, I don't know, how to get people on side again? Well, yeah, sorry, yeah, it's a bit broad, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, it's a very good question, and I think it's a mixture of things. Uh, I read in an article in the in the 90s, uh, written in the 90s, saying that the way capitalism was evolving with less and less regulations and outsourcing, um, with augmentation of of unemployment uh, throughout the world, it would tend to lead to more f to the, the rise of the far right. So that was being said since the 90s, and not regulating as well the influence of money in politics. I think for me, in making this film, what became clear is that democracy is really being asphyxiated by money, be it through legal or illegal lobby, be it through um, the influence it has managed to have in social media, in democracies all over the world in the past years, and how, and that is even m harder to understand because it's done in extremely subterranean, subterranean ways. In Brazil, there was a huge investments in WhatsApp in the last election, uh, spreading fake news about the progressive candidates, and and that had immense influence in the election. So m I think money is one part. And of course, the left has lost a narrative. Um, I think uh, ideologically, it, 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 it needs to reinvent itself, but it is reinventing itself. I think this idea of, the, of more than ever of women uh, occupying space in Congress, people of color in the United States, in Brazil, uh, I don't know if how, how, how that is happening in the UK, but I think people uh, are trying to reclaim democracy, and that's the hope I see right now. Thank you. And um, I guess for the for the Brazilian gentlemen in the audience, and also people interested in further perspectives on on this period of history in Brazil, we have a, a film in the program called Block, which is kind of following the the truckers' protests in in, in Brazil, which are more kind of right aligned. A film called Your Turn, which is really focused on the student movement, left aligned. Um, but I, I want to ask the question now under Bolsonaro's um, presidency and, and regime, what are the further fractions? You portray the kind of history as be being between right and left. Are there further divisions between kind of students and workers, um, between the poor and the rich? Uh, it, it, what are the, the, the further splits happening within Brazilian politics? What is interesting is that the youth which was not very involved in the protests against Doma's impeachment, for example. It was, those protests were more kind of the old left. Um, so have awakened immensely in the past month in Brazil, uh, protesting against huge cuts that the government wants to do in public education. So last two weeks ago, there were like millions of, of young people in this taking the streets all over Brazil. And so that's very hopeful. Um, and yes, there are divisions, of course, um, now that he is in power, uh, people who were with him are no longer with him and are being, uh, who were seen as right are now seen are being seen not as so much right, so there are being fractions um, that are quite interesting to observe. Um, 
we have time for just one more audience question, but I'm sure Petra will be here afterwards in, in the Sherwin Bar or at the Filmmaker Drinks to, to discuss further because there are a lot of hands up out there. I think the gentleman at the back in the stripy shirt was the first one with his hands up. Hand up. Okay, thank you. I'll try and ask a short question then. Uh, I'm from Copenhagen and... Uh, oh, that's my wife calling. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, yes, Maybe uh, she uh, has a question too. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, well, in Denmark, uh, I was at the May 1st uh, demos. Uh, that's a very cozy thing in Denmark. And somebody handed me a note about Lula not being, uh, being uh, corrupt and uh, innocent. And I'd just like to tell everybody here that in, even in Denmark, news don't report this, uh, the story. Uh, not just in British uh, television or whatever. But I was thinking... What I really loved is that many films can be like yours, not, I wouldn't say biased, but have an opinion and follow through and really be on the side of one or the other. But uh, how come you decided to make it so poetic and beautiful? I mean, was that intentional not to make it boring? Or was it just because you always make films like that? Or is it this film in particular? That's it. <laughs> I can make a longer statement if you like. <laughs> So I guess the question is, why, why this style? Is it your personal style, or is it specific to this film? Not your dress, I mean your style in the film. <laughs> thank you. Keep focused. Thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think I am attracted to more, like, you could say, essay-like or lyrical uh, cinema. And trying to get at what moves people rather than how people move, as Pina Bausch says. And, and uh, Brasilia was a gift in terms of, of, a, of a scenery, of a political landscape. Um, that, that city is, is almost like a film set in itself, like a Solaris film set. Not very good for politics or for the or for getting things done um but yeah a good film set and uh, and for us it really offered a breathing space for from such a toxic and vertiginous story and i i our our attempt was to create moments of reflection so that one could zoom out of the chaos of the events and try to to look from a bit from afar, uh, whenever, whenever possible. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm afraid that's all we have time for in terms of the uh, conversation this evening. But please put your hands together for Petra. Thank you very much, Petra. Thank you. Thank you.